Good morning again, everybody. Um, we now move on to our first track, which is the prevention track. And it is my great pleasure to introduce um, the moderators, Faith Karuthi and Jean-Jacques Parienti. Uh, Jean-Jacques is a, is a long-standing and experienced track chair and also an associate professor at the Univers at university's hospital practitioner and medical manager at the hospital center in the University of Cayenne. And Faith Kiruti works for Nairobi City County Government as an adolescent and youth coordinator and is a champion for young women, focusing on sexual and reproductive health rights. And I'm sure they're going to lead us in an excellent uh, session. I keep thinking afternoon session, but for most people it's a morning session, but there we go. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, thank you so much for that, and um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we are having this session. My, my co-facilitator, JJ, will introduce for us the three topics that we'll be discussing, and then we can move on. Jojo, welcome. Mute. Can't be heard. Yes. Mute. You're muted, Janja. Oh, sorry, I, I, I'm on mute. <laughs> so I, I was saying, but you didn't hear that the three steps are prescribing uh, PrEP. The second step is to keep the continuum of PrEP. And the third, probably the most important step is to retain the clients in the, in the, in the field of, of PrEP. So uh, uh, Faith, please, uh, your turn to introduce the first speaker. Thank you very much, JJ. I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker will be talking about uh, who can who shall prescribe prep, and she's Karo, Dr. Karon Gunu Gitaidua. Who holds, she's a, a degree holder in uh, medicine from University of Nairobi and a master's degree in uh, epidemiology from Jomo Kenyatta University. And also she's um, an alumni of uh, CDC FELTEP program and uh, in Kenya. And uh, she has a wide range in research, particularly in HIV and reproductive health, where she has been working for the last six years. And currently she's the deputy director of medical services, and she's ending the division of communicable diseases in and uh, reproductive health uh, programs in Nairobi city. She's a mentor and in an institute of uh, management of information systems in UK and uh, an alumina, and also she's a member of Kenya Medical Association. Thank you very much. Welcome Dr. Carol to take us through your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I appreciate uh, this opportunity just to uh, go through, uh, talk about differentiated prep and really who should be describing. And um, if you'll allow me, I'll just, uh, give a bit of context uh, on PrEP um, in Kenya. And uh, really when uh, we started, I hope you can all see my screen. So we know that PrEP is the use of ARV medication to prevent HIV infection by an infected person who are at substantial risk of acquiring HIV infection. And um, uh, WHO really came up with the strategies for oral PrEP in 2015. For those at substantial risk and as a country in kenya uh, we were able to revise our guidelines on the use of antiviral drugs in treating and preventing hiv infections in kenya and this was the guideline for nascop for 2016 and we included oral prep within that uh, a policy guideline and uh, we had a scale up and uh, had it launched in may of 2017 and uh, in the picture there you can just see an immediate former uh, Director of Medical Services uh, launching uh, the program. In the city of Nairobi, where I work, we introduced PrEP through a series of trials and demonstration projects. And this was uh, in the years of 2015 and 2016. And the target uh, populations uh, for us at that time when we were doing the trials uh, was mainly targeted at serodiscordant couples, um, female sex workers. 
and adolescent girls and young women who are uh, vulnerable and living within the informal settlements. And um, after the success of these projects, we were able to start scale up of the scene. And this we began in October 2016 after the demonstration projects. And we had several introductory meetings and uh, bringing on board uh, the city's health management team and other implementing partners who are working in the HIV prevention space. And together then we came up with the technical wrapping group uh, for the city and we had a presentation from all stakeholders uh, from the county uh, partners and from there we had quarterly meetings just looking at uh, oral prep and the scale up on the scene and we also looked at the lessons that had been learned and shared this with other uh, neighboring counties like Yambu that were also doing this and uh, this now helped us to develop a county prep scale up plan that uh, we officially started in 2017. In the beginning, um, we were targeting health facilities and started with 44 health facilities, but currently uh, we've almost doubled the number and now we have 72 facilities that offer prep services in the city. And just looking at our latest data for September, um, we had a total of 2,778 clients from the different subpopulations that were currently on PrEP in Nairobi. Um, however, this just represented 51% of the eligible population after we had done the screening. So this is just a diagrammatic representation of how our scale-up process for PrEP was between the years of 2016 and 2017, where we started with the initial meetings with our different stakeholders and had a technical working group uh, uh, done and then came up with a plan, of course, based on lessons land and looking at where we wanted uh, to head in terms of targeted numbers and facilities within the city. Then we had the initial selection of the facilities and did some assessments. We then proceeded to do service provider identification and training and set up a supply chain um, just to ensure that we will not run out of the commodity, uh, followed by which we did whole site orientation and defined our client flow and set up also demand creation strategies for PrEP. And then, of course, started the enrollment of clients, and this now has been ongoing for the last three years within the city. Just looking at uh, the trends of PrEP uptake uh, in Nairobi from last year, when we started in 2017, by 2018, our numbers were really good. But somewhere around last year, uh, there was a dip in the number of clients on PrEP. And you can see uh, uh, the blue line just looks at those currently on PrEP. And the red line will uh, look looks at those um, who are who are initially enrolled, and the gray line those who uh, were discharged from prep. And so it is in January this year that we had uh, discussion on how do we increase um, uptake of prep, and we can see that between January and March there was an increase uh, by almost about 800 clients uh, who are currently on prep. However, this plateaued uh, with the onset of COVID-19. And uh, at this point, uh, as much as we had set in place some demand creation strategies to try and improve the numbers, we had to ask ourselves what we would do um, and what needed to do now that the epidemic was on. And uh, in July, we started uh, key population community outreaches. And so this saw an increase in the numbers in that month. Uh, there's been a slight decrease, but we are continuing, and particularly our numbers for PrEP for KPs, um, because we're using a community models, has uh, gone up. So some of the demand strategies that we uh, adopted were, uh, for the key, key populations, we did a lot of community mobilization starting uh, January this year as we we're trying to increase our numbers. And uh, we're working with peers as prep champions for advocacy. And we also did a lot of uh, awareness creation through media and particularly social media. We did health education for key populations and referral from the hotspots. And this was across all the uh, male sex workers, MSMs, FSWs, and the people who inject drugs. For the adolescent uh, population and the girls and young women, we started the increase of scale up at youth uh, for youth friendly services at facilities and did community mobilization and peer mentor support through our Youth Advisory Council, which is a group of young people that we work with uh, in the city and uh, are involved in our technical working groups and offer support in our facilities, particularly focused for young, uh, the youth and particularly young women. We also did gender awareness creation through media, um, health education, and we did plan risk assessment and referrals, which we did during integrated outreaches where we brought in the family planning component and were able to screen um, our adolescent girls and young women within the communities. 
for the discordant couples who are supporting disclosure and sensitizing discordant partners on PrEP, and also offered uh, partner notification services at the CCCs, and particularly for the new clients. Uh, we also did health education and creation of community awareness. For the general population, uh, we scaled up awareness creation, again, using social media, mass media and print media, and also did a lot of health education, particularly within the facilities, but also engaged uh, within uh, during community outreaches and we were able to do risk assessment by service providers and referrals. So that's what we were doing initially, and then COVID came, and so we had to think what or how else do we, what strategies do we adopt to prep? So the current uh, prep delivery model, now that I've taken you through the history of how um, in the city we have, uh, we came up with the prep strategies and started dispensing. Uh, mainly the delivery points are within the comprehensive care clinic, that's the ART clinics, uh, where we have integrated clinics, we are dispensing these at the consultation rooms and in a few private facilities and drop-in centers. When we look at who is prescribing, who is the healthcare team? For the risk assessment, uh, we, we normally have the counselors and the community health volunteers and peer mentors. And we use what we call the RAST tool. This is a risk assessment uh, screening tool that was developed in country and adapted uh, to just uh, check who's at high risk. And normally this will happen mainly when we're having outreaches or within uh, the counseling room when the client comes to the facility. From here, then we have the referral team, and normally this will either be the CHV as a community health volunteer, the peer mentor or healthcare workers, if we are doing this at an outreach. And the prescriber almost always is the clinical officer or the medical officer, uh, which is limited. And just looking at my topic, how then and who really should be prescribing just to ensure access uh, to all. For follow-up, also most of the follow-up is done by the clinical and medical officer in some instances. We have appearance counselors or nurses who can offer support during follow-up visit. Looking at the timelines of how we give PrEP after we prescribe and the follow-up visits, we, we start at month zero and we have a visit at month one and then uh, three months and then every three months. However, looking at the dispensing model, it's done monthly. So we have the uh, clients coming in every month to pick up their medications. So some of the challenges uh, with this delivery model and particularly within uh, this COVID-19 uh, times where there's a lot of restriction in movement um, is uh, prep delivery for us, even as we started, was mainly facility-based and it was mainly provider-initiated. Uh, so the role of the community was very um, minimal and that has been the model that we have been using. And uh, prevention interventions are delivered at the treatment site. So you find that prep is a prevention intervention. However, for most of our, our facilities, it is delivered where the treatment is happening and we find that their stigma levels being high because some clients don't want to be identified with those already on ART. So this poses a big challenge and leads uh, to high dropout. Again, uh, due to this COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the movement restrictions that have been uh, brought about because of this, there is poor access and people are no longer coming uh, to the clinics physically. So expecting them to come every month becomes really a challenge. And also demand creation that we had started in January at community level was interrupted due to COVID-19. We also have quite a big number of unreached populations and particularly the key populations, hence why we started the focus on doing outages uh, targeted for PrEP in July this year. And also women of reproductive age, where we find that um, most of the screening really happens at the HTS, and that's the HIV testing counseling centers. Uh, and not uh, targeted at women at antenatal clinics, uh, MCH and FP, and also multiple service delivery areas and time are needed to access prep because you have to start off with the counselor's office and get referred to the clinician's office, then get referred to the pharmacy. So you find a lot of time wasted, and there could be lots of clients along that cascade from the prescriber up to from the from the person doing the screening up to the point uh, where the client is expected to walk home uh, with their prep. So just looking at strategies towards optimizing PrEP delivery, really um, differentiated care models that could be adopted. And, uh, and for me, I just look at it uh, as a three-pronged approach, looking at the where, looking at the who, and looking at the time that is required um, in terms of uh, how we are doing this dispensation. So for the where, uh, my recommendations, and I think something that needs, we need to embrace um, is to have increased service delivery points, whereby we are not only 
restricting ourselves to one uh, place in the facility, but in expanding the same. So that screening and subsequent prescribing is done at the maternal uh, care clinics and the antenatal care clinics, family planning clinics, and the outpatient clinics. So that it is an integrated model within the facility such that there are several service delivery points. And not only to have the screening at those points, but to have also a prescriber, someone working in that clinic trained as a prescriber so that they prescribe the drugs and then, if possible, to have uh, the pharmacies within this uh, area. So that it's a sort of one-stop shop uh, for the client, reducing time and improving um, the linkages. Also, expansion to private clinics and uh, working with other, you know, strengthening our public-private partnership so that not only is PrEP offered in the public sector, but also giving subsidies so that the private clinics can also be able to offer the PrEP at really subsidized prices, and that uh, really will increase the reach and access uh, because it will be closer to the people. Community centers and safe spaces are also other areas that uh, would be very important to consider. Uh, where we can offer PrEP at those sites. A lot of those sites don't really have trained uh, uh, clinicians. However, how do we capacity build the people working in those spaces to be able to prescribe PrEP and do follow-ups? Uh, we're already working in the drop-in centers, but also to bring in the local pharmacies because we know these pharmacies open late, open over the weekends for longer times. So this is a service delivery point that we may need to also consider. Uh, also, courier and mobile outreach clinics, uh, are a viable um, uh, way to deliver PrEP now that there's a lot of movement restrictions because if we use telemedicine and did online follow-ups, then subsequently we could be able to deliver through courier or mobile clinics uh, to the home states or near where the people or other our clients stay. Just looking at the question of prescribers, who really should be uh, prescribing PrEP? And if we are to increase access and to offer this care closer to the people, then we must uh, train prescribers at all levels. So not only restricting it to the medical officers and clinical officers, but bringing on board the nurses, having the pharmacists working within the local pharmacies, being able to prescribe and possibly even for follow-up taking, being able to take some, some tests, training them on that. Having our CHVs found within the community centers and safe spaces and PR mentors also trained to be able not only to do referrals, but actually offer the prep uh, at the point, particularly if we have a uh, good follow-up and uh, the clients are stable and also bringing in board the counselors as well. So what even as they do the assessment at the testing center, instead of having to refer to another room to get another service, perhaps just giving all the services and training them to be able to prescribe. So these are conversations and considerations that could be very important if you want to increase the access to PrEP and ensure um, that we are having uh, this as an intervention, having the numbers that we have targeted because there's a lot of dropout and we need to mitigate that. So we need to train, we need to mentor them uh, do support supervision for them and train them on the tools and recording so that they all can qualify as prescribers. Also looking at the timelines as the third uh, approach is uh, to have a method to have multi-month dispensing for PrEP, we're already doing it for ART, uh, whereby we are doing uh, three months uh, collection. So, so far we are doing three months uh, consultation after the initial uh, first and second month. However, to actually have them going with the drugs so they don't have to keep coming back every month to the pharmacy to collect the drugs, particularly for those who are stable and being able to offer follow-up and appearance counseling by possibly just using virtual platforms and calling clients. And I think if we do this, then we shall increase um, access uh, to PrEP. So my recommendations for differentiated PrEP will be number one, delivery of PrEP at community level, thinking about outreaches, testing and appearance support at the level of the community, within the community spaces, not having to just be facility focused in our delivery model for PrEP. The other thing is to have strengthened linkages and referrals from community to facility so that it gives the community the confidence that even if they are prescribed at that level, if there's any complication or any challenge that arises or any lab follow-up that is required, um, then the linkage and referral to the facility will be optimal. The other thing is to have public-private partnerships for PrEP delivery, including the local pharmacies, like I've said, definitely have longer opening hours and include, including even over the weekends, or well, most of our facilities might remain closed. And so access uh, is poor, particularly for those who are working an eight to five job. And so they come in and the clinic is closed. Uh, also very critical, and I think what COVID has taught all of us, we must embrace digital technology 
and explore ways of having online follow-up and monitoring, having and establishing virtual safe spaces and support groups um, on the same, and also cyber education for prep awareness and also for COVID-19 because we are living within that pandemic and it is critical for us to keep safe. Uh, using calls and texts, uh, WhatsApp messages for demand creation and enhancing appearance is also critical and something that we must embrace even as we move forward. Uh, There's a study that was done uh, in the western part of Kenya by one of the Dreams uh, projects that we had listed, and it shows access to telephones uh, and mobile phones is quite high, uh, ranging uh, from 76 to 87% for the adolescents aged between 10 to 24 years, even though some of the access is to their parents' phones, but they have access. So we can embrace this and it will work. Also, um, continue using peer mentor support models for all populations. It has worked well, and it's something that we must continue. And the one-stop shop model for PrEP, where I was explaining earlier, where you get screened and get tested is the same place you actually get uh, you know, uh, prescribed for your medication and, and have a pharmacy there so that it takes less time, it's faster, and uh, so our clients are more likely to keep coming back. And also very critical is to empower clients on self-care so that they're able to assess uh, their risk on their own and they're able to you know, communicate on these virtual platforms in case of any issue and, to, and ensure that they don't have to keep coming back to the facilities, but they are also empowered uh, on the scene. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Caro, for the good presentation. It has been a wholesome presentation. And I know there will be a few discussions uh, during the question and answer session, but we appreciate. So I usher in my co-moderator, JJ, to introduce our next uh, panelist who can give us his presentation. Welcome, JJ. Thank you, Faith. So the next presentation is about optimizing the PrEP continuum solution for low PrEP uptake. Uh, and the, the speaker is Professor Mehdi Karkouri, uh, who is professor at the Faculty of Medicine of Morocco, uh, of Casablanca, Morocco, and the president of the Association de Lutte contre le Sida, a community-based organization established in 1988. Dr. Karkouri has been more particularly involved in HIV testing and counseling activities, research and training, and is the resource person for anti-stigma and discrimination policy. He has been also involved in the Middle East, North Africa region, having undertaken missions in several countries of the region and act as a consultant for various international organizations such as the WHO, UNICEF, and the European Commission. Mehdi, it's, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And uh, I would like also to uh, thank the organizers for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to speak here, uh, acknowledging the role of uh, civil society in uh, uh, HIV prevention in that region, a region which not always uh, showing on the map when it comes to uh, HIV and HIV prevention. So thank you very much. And also, um, I'm sorry, there will be some overlapping with the, with the precedent speaker, but it's also, it's a continuum. So of course, uh, there is some uh, overlapping. So uh, we're now almost a decade after uh, TDF FTC was approved for uh, PrEP to reduce risks of HIV infection. And there have been a large increases in the number of persons uh, using PrEP throughout the world. But we have to admit that the rollout of PrEP has not been consistently realized in different regions and within different uh, uh, demographic subgroups. And the data that keeps coming is indicating that there are large communities and regions of uh, uh, the world that are underserved. Uh, like we can see in, uh, in this figure I took from the AVAC report, it's about the UNAIDS fast track targets. We can see that the initial expectations of people under PrEP uh, assumed by the model of the fast tracks is not what we uh, are getting. Especially now that we have uh, even more options available, 
uh, even driven uh, or what we call on demand prep and long acting injectable prep. So all this is pointing to the absolute need to intensify and to improve implementation. So what are the reasons for low prep uptakes? We can summarize it in, uh, f in some um, uh, few uh, main reasons, lack of awareness about PrEP, and we will elaborate on that. Uh, the HIV risk uh, misperception, uh, some non-adapted delivery models, and we had uh, a wonderful model showed in the precedent presentation, accessibility in terms of uh, geographical accessibility, but also financial. Uh, some uh, myths, some misconceptions, and some fears about potential side effects. We know that they are rare with PrEP and also uh, the risk of resistance. Uh, there is a concern that uh, there is a common concern in the, in the medical community that poor adherence may result in the development of resistance, despite the fact that clinical evidence to date suggests that HIV drug resistance with PrEP use rarely occurs but rarely occurs and of course uh, stigma and discrimination so lack of awareness uh, about prep uh, this lack of awareness is from eligible individuals meaning key populations in among which uh, the, the all the studies show that the knowledge of prep is is very low i can uh, uh, cite this uh, meta analysis uh, uh, done in 2017 in low and middle income countries uh, about uh, MSM knowledge uh, about uh, PrEP and it showed that the proportion of, of MSM who were aware of uh, PrEP was as low as 30 uh, percent contrasting with their very high uh, proportion of respondents willing to use PrEP uh, once they knew about it, which was 65%. So there is a lack, uh, there is some missed opportunity here. Um, but this limited or this lack and or limited knowledge also applies for healthcare workers. And we, we of course, understand that uh, um, uh, prescribing rate of PrEP is directly linked to the awareness of uh, PrEP by, by healthcare providers. Uh, we can also notice that there is uh, that uh, people living with HIV uh, are not also aware of uh, of PrEP, which is of concern because uh, they wouldn't be able to advise their partners to to use PrEP otherwise. Uh, HIV risk uh, misperception. Uh, we know that there is an underestimation of HIV acquisition risk uh, by. Uh, by key population. This is documented in several uh, studies. There is also this uh, lack of concern about HIV, especially for the younger adults and, and adolescents. And um, what is paradoxical is that the populations reported to have low perceived risk uh, are often those who uh, bear disproportionate HIV risk, such as MSM, transgenders, women experiencing gender-based uh, violence, etc. But uh, healthcare providers also fail sometimes to accurately estimate the risk of HIV of their clients or, or patients because of an insufficient assortment of HIV risk, because they don't have uh, a consistent knowledge uh, about sexual orientation and sometimes some about some specific sexual practices and because also sometimes they are not feeling comfortable discussing openly sexuality with their clients. Uh, so PrEP uh, uh, has also caused some PrEP shaming. We've all heard about the very unfortunate ter terms of Truvada horse, PrEP horse, uh, spreading the, uh, the, the, the thinking that uh, people who are using PrEP engage in reckless sexual behavior, spreading STIs, and have no morality, which is, uh, of course, absolutely not true. Uh, there is a confusion between the PrEP for prevention and ERVs for treatment, so some 
people won't use PrEP because they are afraid if they do so to be perceived as uh, HIV positive in, in individuals. There is also uh, some providers that have uh, been concerned by an increase in sexual behavior by PrEP users due to the fact that their perception uh, that uh, they are no, no more at high risk of HIV, that's what we know as risk compensation, and uh, this may foster reluctance to prescribe PrEP. We know the studies have shown that there is no or very little risk compensation among uh, key um, population. Criminalization is also a form of stigma uh, in, in, our, in, in my country and my region where I work, uh, homosexuality, sex work, drug use are illegal, so people won't engage in, in, um, in PrEP activities because it's linked somehow uh, uh, to this concept. And of course, uh, like the, the, what I, we call the usual suspects of stigma, stigma related to HIV and to, uh, to AIDS, which is still very uh, prevalent uh, in a lot, in a, lot parts of the of the world homosexuality sex work uh, non-adapted delivery models can also result in low uptake uh, of uh, of prep and here we can uh, stress on the limitations of the conventional healthcare system model uh, which uh, we know a key population have a lot of distrust towards this conventional healthcare system because they are afraid to, to, to use it because of the stigma of discrimination of the of the criminalization of their of their behavior. Uh, so often the conventional healthcare system is you know highly burdened, long waiting hours, overpacked services, the feeling by some healthcare providers that you know it's not very important to put people uh, under prep. Uh, uh, if you come, if they compare it to saving lives or you know treating uh, me medical con conditions, uh, operating hours are not flexible. Sometimes the providers are not treated. Uh, we have also logistical barriers, so individuals may experience difficulty in getting to the clinic due to the lack of transportation, due to the fact that it's in a remote area, or due to time constraint and also the financial accessibility who is paying for prep is it out of pocket which is not really an option in in the low and middle income countries uh, are drugs only covered or uh, what about stis and what about lab testing so as uh, there are a lot of solutions to overcome those uh, those challenges uh, and the first one is education. Education is intended in um, a broad uh, meaning, uh, starting with the wide diffusion, diffusion of PrEP information, the PrEP promotion among uh, potential users and using and taking advantage of all the technology, all what the technology can offer, uh, internet website, dating apps, using client advocates or peer navigators that has proved to be working very well in some parts of, of the world, providing adequate training for healthcare providers, of course, addressing their misconceptions uh, and all the false information that they can have, uh, introducing PrEP and uh, combined prevention in general in medical and paramedical studies. Those are new concepts and uh, my generation and a lot of generation of providers hasn't been studying uh, those very interesting uh, concepts. Also providing stigma reduction activities, uh, education, using role models. Um, we can also improve accessibility by adopting the community model of, uh, of PrEP. Uh, so we can make PrEP available at com community points of care, um, extending access to PrEP, use original locations and modes of delivery, walk-in clinics, pharmacies, substance use clinics, e emergency rooms, uh, at-home services also, taking advantage and leveraging technology, the old one like SMS, which now it's old, but also the innovative technology, uh, telemedicine, which has been uh, really developing during the, the, the lockdown, the instant messaging, 
we can also uh, improve the integration of prep services uh, within STI screening, STI uh, screening and combined uh, bio biomedical HIV prevention. They share strong inter interdependencies. STI diagnoses are indications for prep use, and uh, STI infections themselves uh, increase HIV uh, vulnerability. So better integrating those two services and strongly linking them would certainly benefit PrEP implementation. And of course, uh, as much as we can address in social economical vulnerabilities, food, shelter, safety, uh, childcare, for example, community is uh, uh, pivotal. Community mobilization is very, very important if we want to uh, improve PrEP uptake. And we can, we can almost do everything within the community, prep initiation, dispensation, follow up, but the community has to be involved in the whole process, starting from planning, not, not, you know, not be just a provider. A community has to be um, uh, involved in planning, design, service provision, evaluation, of course. Uh, in order to provide a comprehensive user-friendly package of uh, HIV and sexual health services, including, um, including PrEP. Community can be very flexible, so we can have flexible operating hours. We can do, for example, moonlighting, which we can absolutely not even think about it when, we, when it comes to the conventional healthcare system. Community can also uh, lead the way in, in research and help uh, fill in research gaps. And I cannot end my talk without uh, talking about the massive impact of uh, COVID-19 on, on PrEP uptake. And this is due, of course, partly because of uh, the reduction of sexual activity and partner uh, numbers, but also mobility restrictions, the lockdowns, all the travel uh, restrictions, they have hindered access to uh, PrEP services when they are... Um, when they, when they are available. So we have um, to, uh, uh, there is of course a risk in, uh, of uh, upswing in HIV transmission if the country doesn't uh, set up a plan of uh, timely PrEP uh, resumption. And we have not seen many of those plans, uh, especially now that we're even uh, being hit by the second and the third wave of uh, of COVID, so a lot of um, of country has and community has tried to overcome the impact of COVID nineteen. For example, by switching services to telemedicine or phone WhatsApp services, what we call teleprep. Uh, they have uh, set in place, like in my uh, co uh, organization, alternative modes of prep drugs delivery outreach delivery by sent drugs by courier hand delivery sometimes for going or delaying routine lab testing as the labs are now overwhelmed and of uh, also they are prioritizing covid-19 test, uh, testing and also by re reorganizing services providing uh, ppe for the providers uh, instituting uh, physical distancing limiting the number of uh, of clients so, in conclusion, uh, optimal impact of PrEP as a preventive intervention is yet to be realized around the world, and actual implementation of PrEP has been relatively limited despite important successful stories. So, overcoming uh, those barriers will require a comprehensive approach that combines fin financial, social, educational, and structural interventions, including enabling legal and policy framework environments. And thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Mehdi, for this excellent presentation. Uh, indeed, the COVID-19 doesn't help. Uh, the, the least to say. So uh, let's move on to the third uh, presentation. Uh, Faith, it's your turn to introduce our last speaker. Thank you, JJ, and thank you for the earlier presenters. Um, good knowledge. 
from the earlier presenters and looking forward to more. So our next presenter will be Dr. Elope, who is a medical doctor. She completed a degree in medicine in the University of Florida. And then she underwent an internal medicine uh, um, residence and infectious disease fellowship training at the University of Barama. And during this time, she was under a mentorship from Dr. Michael. She has an MPH in applied epidemiology. She has interest in uh, research, especially she focuses on social determinants of STDs, uh, including HIV. And currently she's an instructor as the medical and director of university. And, in, and she's uh, looking, she's um, in inclusion of internal medicine, residency program at the University of Bahama. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Eloke and welcome, and we are looking forward to getting your presentation. Welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to close out the panel, which all have been absolutely wonderful presentations about uptake and the continuum for prep care, and close it out on what are some challenges when it comes to retention in prep care, which I think as an HIV care provider and a prep provider has been kind of an enigma for many. Um, so to begin, I put up a disclosure side that just shows that I um, do some consultation work for MedIQ, which is a CME accreditation unit. For the talk today, we're gonna review kind of the definitions of what retention and adherence means when it comes to prep, which has been hard to define. Um, overview some common barriers I think most people are finding for persistence in care. Highlight that there are multiple disparities when it comes not only to uptake, but to persistence as well. And then I'll highlight some ways forward that have been um, introduced by other researchers in the field. So as we've already reviewed that right now, we know that there's a large number of people who have an indication for PrEP based off of um, what the CDC and other um, health organizations have identified as quote unquote risk factors. And the number is probably much larger. And in a gain frame stance, um, most people would probably like to be on something that they know would help prevent them from getting HIV. And as we're moving forward, I think what's been hard when it comes to HIV um, versus PrEP care is that we do not have a good way to monitor adherence when it comes to PrEP. So adherence really refers to how closely a patient is following a dosing regimen um, that provides protection. And we know that with um, pre-exposure prophylaxis for men who have sex with men specifically, if you take at least four doses per week, um, you have greater than 90% and some studies 95% efficacy at reducing your risk of getting HIV if you were to be exposed. Um, right now, when it comes to clinical practices, there are not really any um, biomarkers that help us identify how adherent people have been when it comes to PrEP um, and what's been used in clinical trials for short-term um, evaluation like urine, TDF levels, um, and long-term adherence measures like hair and dry blood spots are not really available for clinical practices. And so a lot of us have been um, asked to really use self-report when it comes to adherence and look at things like persistence in PrEP care, which tells us from a patient's perspective, how likely are they and how often are they filling their PrEP prescriptions and making their appointments. And this has been in um, a lot of studies monitored anywhere from three to six months. I've seen a few that have done nine. And that's because we know that for PrEP care right now, it's recommended that people come in every three months to get screening for HIV and STIs and also refills for their meds. And we know that once someone were to stop PrEP per se for um, any given reason, usually the protection wanes after seven to 10 days. So PrEP prescription a lot of times will also inadvertently tell us that people are getting enough drug to protect them. So what we've found overall, I think, is that persistence has waned. Um, in the beginning, when we were looking at clinical trials, there were several that showed us that adherence was hard when it came to PrEP and that if you had greater adherence, you had greater protection. But several demonstration projects have also shown us that there are not only late PrEP adopters, but that about 37 to 62% of people discontinue PrEP by six months after they have started. Um, higher rates of PrEP discontinuation are often seen amongst our most vulnerable populations that are at highest risk of contracting HIV, including youths and um, Black men who have sex with men, Black transgender women, and Black cisgender women. 
Um, this is a study that was done that I think nicely illustrates this, um, looking at over 11,000 commercially insured and 647 Medicaid insured persons um, with PrEP prescriptions. And they looked at this over using three month time frame, seeing that commercially insured patients had a median time of about 13.7 months um, when it came to being adherent to PrEP or persistent with PrEP care compared to 6.8 months for those who had Medicaid, which is our publicly uh, insured offerings here in the States. We also saw in the study that cisgender women, people who had younger age, people who live in rural areas and identified as black had shorter persistence rates. And overall, when they looked at adjusted covariates, female or cisgender, individuals and people with younger age had per higher prediction rates of non-persistence. And again, this is just showing you what I was describing by age that you see overall this lower rate of persistence for those who are in this age bracket from 18 to 24 versus those in the higher age brackets from 55 to 64. And again, showing this once we look at it, that African-Americans have lower rates of persistence compared to their white counterparts. So I think the question is, why does this matter? From a clinical standpoint, when we're talking about PrEP, usually our indicators of whether somebody is quote unquote at risk from the CDC tells us that they have STIs in the past six months or if they're in a group of individuals that we know higher, have higher rates of HIV. But overall, what we found is that even when you have one sex partner, based off epidemiology, especially local epidemiology, if you're in a group that has higher incidence rates of HIV, likely if you discontinue PrEP, you have higher rates of contracting the virus. And this is a study that I think really uh, changed a lot of people's perceptions around what happens to people once they stop PrEP. It was a talk that was done at IAS that focused on really over 986 individuals who initiated PrEP in San Francisco in the United States from July 2012 to November 2018. This was a fairly diverse population of individuals, uh, median age of 35, mostly men who have sex with men. And they had eight serous conversions for those who stopped PrEP. And seven of those individuals um, completely stopped PrEP and one reported stopping or attempting to do a 211 uh, intermittent dosing. And when they went back and they asked these individuals, well, what were some of the barriers? Why did you stop PrEP? They found that the major themes were really that people had competing, competing demands. They reported having issues with housing, substance use, or mental health disorder. People reported having difficulty prioritizing PrEP because they felt that the costs were too high um, and it was really too much effort to come in every three months to be seen. A lot of the individuals, probably about half of the population um, that stopped PrEP, reported that they were in a monogamous relationship and did not feel that their quote unquote risk um, merited them being on PrEP any further and they were entrusting intimate partner relationships. So with the relevant revelation that really we don't have a grasp of what truly is indicated for PrEP when it comes to most individuals and PrEP persistence while challenging is something that we should be really encouraging for most of our patients if they're willing and not necessarily based off of what our risk parameters are. I want to also highlight the fact that if we have these issues with persistence going forward, really the highest hit populations are going to be those that are most vulnerable. So this is another study that was done in San Francisco that again showed um, from a PrEP registry of 348 patients that was pretty decently mixed, 80% men have sex with men, 39% white, um, and 12% black patients, most publicly insured, that those that had the lowest rates of discontinuation were, again, older patients, but that the people who probably were the most vulnerable had higher rates of discontinuation of PrEP, and that was black patients, people who reported IV drug use, and transgender women. And this study also, again, highlights the fact that we're not only seeing these disparities when it comes to PrEP persistence, but in studies where they actually have been able to measure adherence, so your ability to take that medication and have protective levels within your blood, 
we're still seeing disparities when it comes to race. And this study nicely showed that for people who have low adherence, you're more likely to see it among African Americans compared to their counterparts who are white. And then again, seeing um, disparities in our Latinx community as well. And from a geographic standpoint, uh, especially for U.S. populations, our highest burden of HIV is currently in the South. And there have been studies that have been specifically done in Southern locales that have shown, again, that we have issues when it comes to persistence overall. Um, this is something that was done in Atlanta, Georgia, that showed that over a period of time, when you're looking at how many patients actually were a available and able to start PrEP. Um, unfortunately, over time, from the 399 clients that were screened for PrEP, um, 392 started, only 158 um, returned for PrEP screening, 234 patients actually received the prescription, and then only 69 clients remained persistent on PrEP, which was measured as being um, on PrEP for greater than six months. Another study that focused primarily on um, one of our most vulnerable populations, young black men who have sex with men, really showed again that there is a huge issue and um, inability right now for us to have good persistence when it comes to PrEP care. So the study was done by Sirota and all, and again was focused in Atlanta, Georgia, and had young black men who have sex with men aged 16 to 29 as a part of this elemental uh, longitudinal cohort. They had over 298 individuals enrolled in the study. And what was great about this study, um, which is not necessarily reflective of real world prep care, is that for this cohort, you were enrolled in the study regardless of what um, has been defined as risk, because they recognize from an epidemiologic standpoint that um, based off of how many people within an uh, area have HIV, it determines really what your quote unquote, again, risk is for getting HIV. So you were enrolled regardless and offered PrEP if you were willing and you wanted. And PrEP was completely free in this cohort. So there were no charges associated with medication or the visits. And what they found, again, is that most people fell out of PrEP care. So in spite of 75% of participants reporting condylless anal sex um, in this cohort, only 44% initiated PrEP over a two-year study period. A quarter waited more than nine months to start PrEP, despite PrEP education, and 44% were at substantial risk from um, HIV compared to the 6% that were taking PrEP at baseline. And this cohort had 23 incident HIV infections over that two-year period of time. So what are the barriers when it comes to persistence? And I think really one of the biggest barriers is stigma. The same as what we see when it comes to uptake and overall the PrEP continuum. And there's multiple levels of stigma. There is what has been deemed PrEP stigma, which is largely interrelated and connected to HIV stigma. And I think this is mostly um, something that from a research standpoint, we have been studying separately that probably needs to be combined because we know that the issues that we have when it comes to people being concerned about disclosure around HIV and being able to take HIV medication in a safe and um, con confidential manner are also issues when it comes to PrEP patients because there are concerns that you will be mistaken for being HIV positive or living with HIV if you are found to be on PrEP. We also know that there's social stigma around taking PrEP, and this leads a lot of times to that decreased prioritization that we were talking about, where people do not feel like they're at risk. And this social stigma wraps around the fact that most people feel like you are at risk for HIV if you report high number of sex partners or condomless sex. Um, and I think that this has pushed many to move to gain-framed conversations and sex positivity around sexual health and discussing PrEP and HIV overall. And then there's also stigma on the provider side and this idea that number one, you have to be an infectious diseases physician to provide PrEP, which is not true and needs to be probably um, done away with because we know that a lot of people don't feel comfortable coming to ID docs who take care of people living with HIV due to the larger stigma that's occurring within our societies. And, um, we need to encourage our primary care providers and more non-traditional platforms to prescribe PrEP. And one thing that I think was done really well in HPTN 082, which is an open label PrEP study um, among 
adolescent 16, 24 year old women in Zimbabwe um, and South Africa from 2016 to 2018, they did in-depth interviews with women, um, 67 overall, asking about specifically stigma and how it affected adherence and persistence in prep care. And what they found is that there was a large level anticipated stigma and enacted and experienced stigma once people were discovered to be on PrEP, but that with things like PrEP disclosure, many of the women felt empowered and able to combat PrEP, and that overall um, persistence improved as people became almost PrEP ambassadors. Other barriers to prep persistence that are real are structural barriers, which have been discussed. The fact that we know that uh, costs, insurance coverage, frequency, frequency of visits and transportation are all barriers, especially in more rural locales. Um, we need comprehensive services for people, not just focused on HIV prevention, but on other mental health needs and um, substance use disorders and non-traditional PrEP delivery models. So there have been many studies that have looked at things like PrEP at home, um, pharmacy-based PrEP, and telemedicine, which has become ever so more relevant during COVID-19. And most of our interventions need to be multi-level, not just focusing on individual level risk, but talking about our social context in which people live, the community in which they live, and also looking at public policies. Our, Interventions need to be focused on education so that stigma can be reduced um, and tailored towards special populations that we know are at higher risk for non-persistence. They need to focus on increasing engagement across communities. And overall, regardless of whether we decrease stigma, um, we also need to work on the other side and making sure that we have access so that if people are willing and able and want to be on PrEP, they have the ability to access that PrEP in a comprehensive setting um, because otherwise our, our interventions are going to fall flat. So that's pretty much what I had for my conversation for you all today. And I want to thank the other panelists um, and the ability from IPAC to be on this panel. So thank you. Um, thank you so much for the good presentation. And um, this uh, juncture, I want to thank all the three uh, panelists for the insightful presentations that they have done. Uh, people full of knowledge. Wow, that's very nice. Um, we now want to get dive into some few questions that have actually been asked by some of the uh, listeners who have been who joined us in the discussions. And uh, maybe I will dive to the first question before I hand over to my co-moderator. My first question goes to Dr. Karongunu from Kenya. Um, someone is asking us to explain to us how the numbers in Nairobi increased from 2019 to uh, July to, to July 2020, uh, considering that uh, after the pandemic of COVID, there was lockdown. Or do we have an issue with data management? So that is the question that was being that has been asked for you to clarify or what strategies maybe that Nairobi has been doing to have the continuation of the numbers going up for prep uptake. Over to you, Dr. Caro. Uh, thank you very much, Faith, and uh, thank you very much, Miriam Ombija, for uh, that question. Um, as I was explaining as during my presentation. Um, we saw a dip last year uh, from July on until December in the number of uh, uh, newly enrolled people on PrEP. So our current PrEP current was quite low. And so uh, from December, we came up with strategies and I shared them, the demand creation strategies for the different uh, subpopulations that we are targeting in Kenya and uh, particularly within the city of Nairobi uh, just to improve demand. And we saw the fruits of that because from December to March, there was a consistent rise in the number of new clients on PrEP and the treatment current. And um, however, when the lockdown happened, as you are rightfully saying, um, there was a dip. In fact, uh, between March and April, our enrollment dropped by over 200 uh, for that month. Uh, however, NASCO put into place uh, a guidance in terms of multi month dispensing and community ART. And so we were able to ride on that wave. However, our numbers remained uh, stable until around June. And so we sat again and asked, how do we, uh, even with the lockdown, increase demand? And we targeted the KPs. And that's why in July, we started doing outreaches. And if you look at the trend 
of our data. Then we started seeing a now again an increase um, in the months of August and September uh, because of these outreaches where we would now take prep to the communities and do the screening um, in the hotspots uh, for the KPs and enroll them. So for us, uh that that's how the, the the trend looks like but yes in the face of the lockdown there was a chance however we never really dropped our numbers but they were not increasing during that time but with the outreaches we have seen an amazing increase and we have extended the same to through the dreams projects within the country to the adolescent girls and young women and we are hoping to see an improvement uh in the number of people taking prep even as we move forward uh thank you back to you faith Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Caro, for the answer. So I will hand over to my co-moderator, JJ, to take over the next yes, we have, question that's ad being addressed by the next person. We have a, a second question from the audience by, by Jeffrey Docre, who, who asked uh, to Dr. Karkouri, uh, since many, uh, as you presented in, in Morocco, since many of the risk factors for for being on PrEP are illegal in your country. The question is, can PrEP can be prescribed in your country legally? Yes, thank you. Thank you for highlighting this, uh, this paradox uh, that we are living here. Yes, it is uh, completely illegal. However, when it comes to the, to the health, it is uh, absolutely okay. So for example, in the, in the strat national strategic plan of the very official uh, national strategic plan of the Ministry of Health, uh, men having sex with men, sex workers, uh, injecting drug users are clearly put as uh, target uh, groups and uh, key populations. So yes, uh, when it comes, when it's uh, when we are working with the the Ministry of Health, we can absolutely prescribe uh, prep. We can do prevention for key population. But when it comes to uh, homeland or security, it's another affair. So that's the paradox we are living in. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a question for for. Uh, 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 Latesa, Latesha, uh, you were presenting uh, some result of persistence, and it's true that persistence is really a problem on, on PrEP, but the definition of persistence, unlike HIV-infected patients, is, is more uh, more difficult because the people, how do, in the, pe in the papers you've read, how, how do they define that, that People just were not were not correct to stop prep because they they, they were not no more at risk. You, you, I don't know if you, you get my question, but I think it's it's very difficult. I mean, pharmacy refill is not sex refill. You, you don't know. No, I completely agree with you. I think that's one of the hard parts about uh, being a prep provider. And most of the studies that I looked at, once people stop prep, they don't go back and ask patients or look at HIV incidence rates to see if people really um, were still probably going to benefit from being on prep. And that's why I presented that one study from that was in an IAS because they did go back and looked at the cohort overall. And for those who stopped, they had those um, individuals who zero converted. So I think there is evidence right now for other studies that are similar to that one that suggests that for people who stop PrEP, and most of the time it's because they felt like they have decreased um, risk um, or in an intimate relationship uh, and only have one sex partner, that there is a substantial risk still for them to seroconvert to HIV. On that part, probably that long acting PrEP is the solution, the best solution. But we, they are not in the in the good pharmacy yet. Okay. Uh, for for the discussion uh, we we face, we have some questions that are maybe a bit provocative. But uh, we we uh, we would like to have your 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 uh, opinion. On the question of of the the role of the financial uh, costs in your settings, uh, we, we have the chance to have a, a large setting wor worldwide. Uh, wh what is the weight of financial disclosure? Latesha, I heard you. 
in your presentation, you said that PrEP were, were given free, free of charge. And despite that, people were stopping it. So in your experience, I'm, I'm asking to the three panelists, what is the weight of financial uh, con constraints on, on the problem of, of, of PrEP? prep? Um, I can I can speak for you know that for one the US. for the U.S. Yeah. Um, so I'm in a southern community in Alabama, and we have not expanded Medicaid. So most of our patients are um, affluent uh, and probably not the most vulnerable populations. That I think, from a public health standpoint, we would like to engage in effective HIV prevention strategy. So it plays a huge role. The costs are, are prohibitive when it comes to being able to come in and see doctors on a three month um, time frame. And I think that is something from a policy standpoint, we're going to have to to address definitely. Okay. And in, in Morocco, uh, I think stigma is, is more, is, has a, 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 a is the biggest, uh, is the biggest challenge, not really cost. F stigma f f comes first. Yes, absolutely. Uh, in Morocco, PrEP is funded by the government. And of course, this has made uh, uh, possible because of we, we have access to generics and of, of a lot of uh, uh, purchasing mechanism, bulk purchasing, etc. that allows, you know, it to, to have PrEP, which costs, I think, less than less than $10, $10 per client per year, so which is really affordable. So that's not really the point. And we have, uh, we have, we have uh, conducted a small study asking the PrEP users and also the non-users if, uh, if PrEP, uh, uh, if you would to purchase PrEP, how, how much uh, are you able to, to put? And uh, we had uh, two, uh, two, uh, two to $5 per month, which is, I mean, that could cover generic uh, prep, but yes, yeah, stigma is, is is the most important uh, barrier to, to prep, and also the the, the unfavorable uh, legal environment that uh, that criminalize a lot of uh, of uh, you know, homosexuality, sex work, and we cannot work freely because of that uh, environment. Even if we have our ways to. Uh, to uh, to work otherwise. Yeah, okay. and uh, also in Kenya, I think uh, similarly, just in uh, just like in Morocco, stigma is a big big challenge. And um, just looking at the issue of prep delivery, it is uh, paid for by government, so the clients really don't pay for that. And it is interesting to note that uh, because there are certain baseline tests that we must take a care and clearance and the other tests. And most of them cost between ten to twenty dollars, and most over ninety percent of our clients are unable to actually pay for this. So, if there was a cost attached to prep, then it would definitely reduce uh, the amount, uh, number of people actually willing to take uh, prep. And stigma really um, is a challenge also uh, within Kenya. Thank you. Okay, I think we have two minutes uh, left. Well. On one hand, when when I hear you uh, speaking, uh, I'm wondering if if the if I hear that the people who need the more the prep are not uh, prescribed prep, I have a bad feeling that I am wondering if 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 prep is finally cost effective because because it, it doesn't reach the, the the group that is at the most uh, at risk. So. On one hand, it it makes me sad, and on the on the other hand, uh, I I look uh, for 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 good days. It, when I say that it prevents anyway, it prevents some pre some contaminations, and and the the pharmaceutical industry is is developing new drugs. What what about new drugs in in Morocco or or or, um, or Kenya? What about uh, for example, TAF? TAF FTC. Do you use TAF FTC or, or, or is it uh, the gen generic TDF? Uh, for uh, Morocco, it's generic uh, TDF. And uh, regarding TAF, you know, uh, it will depend on the price, of course. Mm. And in Morocco? Uh, and and same, in uh, Kenya? Same case, same, case, same case for Kenya. 
we are doing the generic and uh, we are not uh, giving tough um, and let the connection is not good and, and latisha you, you you use either TAF or tdf in the us We've been prescribing TAP um, for some of our patients who have uh, kidney dysfunction, but there are some patients who have come in and requested it. I think there's been a lot of commercials that come out have um, kind of talked about risk for TDF with kidneys and bone toxicity. So patients are scared yeah, that something's going to happen and they request it. Okay. So I think it's time to, to thank the three speakers for having us uh, having them with us and uh, and close this session of the prevention track. Uh, so we have a 15 minutes break and uh, we have to be returned at uh, uh, 11 uh, uh, 15 for uh, the continuation of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>